so chapter three was our longest chapter, but it actually broke into more or less five categories. We had our mean value theorem. We spent all these sections on curve analysis, finding things like relative max, relative min, absolute max, absolute min, points of inflection. Uh, we had our section on optimization, which was the word problems, Newton's method, and differentials. Uh, we'll start with mean value theorem. So mean value theorem actually broke into two categories. We had the conditions that if f of x was continuous on a closed interval and uh, differentiable on an open interval, then f prime of c equals f of b minus f of a all over b minus a. Basically, visually, what that meant was if I had a function that went something like this, if I calculated the slope between the two endpoints, somewhere in the middle, the derivative had to have um, the same value. And the rules theorem was sort of a subcategory of mean value theorem, basically saying that if f of a equals f of b, then at some point in the middle, f prime of c has to equal zero, which makes sense because if you look at the um, definition of mean value theorem, if f of b equals f of a, then we have zero in the numerator. So I have two examples I'm going to use to talk about mean value theorem. Um, basically, an algebraic one. So we want to show that mean value theorem applies to this function, x plus 1 over x, on the interval 1 half to 4. So first of all, we want to make sure that f of x is continuous um, on the interval 1 half to 4 which it is because the only point of discontinuity is at x equals 0. Then you want to check that it's differentiable, which means that f prime of x has to be continuous, and f prime of x equals 1 minus x to the negative 2, which is also continuous on the interval 1 half to 4. Same thing, it's not continuous at x equals 0. So then by mean value theorem, there has to be a value in between such that f prime of c equals f of 4, minus f of 1 half all over 4 minus 1 half. So if I substitute in 4, I get 4 plus 1 fourth minus 1 half plus 2 all over 4 minus 1 half. Simplifying, um, I get the derivative, which is 1 minus c to the negative 2, taking it from my second line, has to equal 1 half. And then solving for c, I get c equals plus or minus the square root of 2. But I only want the c value between 1 half and 4, so my final answer has to be just the square root of 2 answer. So that's kind of a, uh, sort of an algebraic application of mean value there. Now, we also did several proofs or explanations as to why um, something has to be true, applying the mean value there. So if it took 14 seconds for a thermometer to rise from 19 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, explain why at some point the mercury must have been rising at a rate of 8 degrees Celsius per second. So here we had to make some assumptions before we could apply mean value theorem. So we had to assume, actually before we even assumed, we defined a function. So let f of t represent temperature as a function of time. That way when we start using f of t in the problem, we'll know what we're talking about. And then we had to assume f of t is continuous. Now on our interval, um, on the given interval, which in this case was 14 seconds. So zero is less than t is less than or equal to 14 seconds. And assume f of t is differentiable for the same interval. So once we said that, then we could say, then my mean value theorem there is a C between 0 and 14 such that F prime of C equals F of 14 minus F of 0 all over 14 minus 0. So using the information, that means 100 
minus negative 19 all over 14, which equals 8.5. Now, the question I don't think had an 8.5 in it. It had an 8 degrees Celsius per second. So we have to conclude with our answer. If the temperature had a rate of 0 degrees Celsius per second at the beginning, and at some point C had a rate of 8.5 degrees Celsius per second, then by intermediate value there, there must have been a time when it rose at a rate of 8 degrees Celsius per second. So we combine a little bit of mean value theorem with intermediate value theorem. All right, so then our big section of curve sketching. So here I have an example where I tried to include just about everything that we did in chapter 3. Um, first, let's review our asymptotes. So we have a vertical asymptote at x equals 0, because at x equals 0, we get a number over 0, which is our indication that we have a vertical asymptote. And then we analyze the asymptote from both sides. So the limit is x approaches 0 from the right of x cubed plus 1 over x. So notice I get 1 in the numerator. I get something really small and positive in the denominator. So that equals infinity. Um, if I use the limit as x approaches 0 from the left of x cubed plus 1 over x, again, I get 1 in the numerator, but now I get something small and negative in the denominator. So this approaches negative infinity. So if I could start including that in my graph over here, I know as x approaches 0 from the right, it's going to go this way, and as x approaches 0 from the left. It's going to go this way. Now, we talked about end behavior. So if the uh, degrees in the top and bottom are the same, then I have a horizontal asymptote. If the bottom is degree is larger, then it's an uh, asymptote at y equals 0. In this case, the top degree is larger, so we're going to have to do some long division. Now we can't divide anymore. So that means that our n behavior is the asymptote y equals x squared. So I will put this y equals x squared. Right. Okay, so that was the n behavior kind of analysis. Now I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative and look at my relative maximum. So given this function has two things on top and one term on the bottom, I'm going to go ahead and simplify it before I start taking the derivative. So my first derivative is going to equal 2x minus x to the negative 2. I'm going to get a common denominator for this. So 2x cubed minus 1 over x squared. So my critical points are when the derivative equals 0 or does not exist. So in this case, I have a critical point at x equals 0 and x equals the cube root of one half. So if I do a number line for this, and remember to always label your number line, that way you remember where you're substituting it into. In this case, I'm substituting it into the first derivative because I'm trying to figure out the increasing and decreasing. So if I substitute in something like negative 2, I'm going to get a negative number in the numerator, a positive number in the denominator, so that's going to be negative. If I substitute in something really close to 0, I'm going to get something negative in the numerator, positive in the denominator, so again a negative. And then if I substitute in something like 10, positive divided by positive, so it's going to be positive. So that means it's decreasing, decreasing, and then increasing, which means cube root of 1 half is going to be decreasing then increasing, which makes this a relative mix. And to find the y value, for my relative minimum, 
you're going to take your x value here, cube root of 1 half, and substitute it into the original function. So if I substitute it into the original function, I'm going to get 1.5 over the cube root of 1 half as a result. So that means my function is decreasing and then decreasing, increasing, and then I've got some kind of a relative minimum in here somewhere. So now I'm going to move on to my second derivative, which is going to tell me my concavity and points of inflection. So my second derivative, d squared y over dx squared, is going to be 2 plus 2x to the negative 3. Same thing, I'm going to get a common denominator. So 2x cubed plus 2 all over x cubed. Um, I'm just double checking here. All right, so that means that I have, if I set this equal to 0 or does not exist, that means I have critical points for the second derivative at x equals negative 1 or x equals 0. So same thing. I'm going to do a number line for my second derivative, put in both of my critical points, and it's important to include the ones where it does not exist because it could still change sign around that point. So if I substitute in something like negative 7, I get a negative on top, negative on bottom, so that's positive. If I substitute in something like negative 1 half, positive divided by negative, and if I put in something like 5, positive divided by 5. So, just to kind of reiterate, what this means is if it's positive, it's concave up, then concave down, then concave up. Negative 1, therefore, is a point of inflection because it's equal to 0 and it changes sign. So remember, it's important to check both of those um, characteristics to indicate a point of inflection. So same thing, if I take negative 1, substitute it into the original, I get 0. 0, therefore, is not a point of inflection, because even though it doesn't change, even though it changes sign, we know at x equals 0, we had a vertical asymptote. So now I can add a point of inflection to my graph at negative 1, 0. And if I put in all my pieces of information, remember I went concave up and concave down. So concave up and concave down, always decreasing. Second part over here was always concave up. And it looks something like that. So that is the graph in our entirety. Now, we also did things where we had to interpret a graph. So what I have here is a graph of g prime, and I want to just talk about some of the features that can come up. Now, first thing I mentioned way back in chapter three was what you could do is translate this graph into a number line. So notice I have critical points at negative 3, negative 1. I have a critical point at 2 and somewhere around, let's say, 3.3. And at all those places, my derivative is 0. And then if I were to just translate this graph onto a number line, when it's less than negative 3, the graph is below the x-axis. So that means it's negative, then positive, positive, negative, and positive. So now it's a little bit easier to read the number line instead of the graph. So notice at negative 3, the graph g prime went from negative to positive. So that means this has to be a relative min. Negative 1 goes from positive to positive. So that's one of those like plateau sort of situations. Positive to positive or negative means it's a relative max. And then negative to positive means it's a relative min. So that's reading straight from the graph, translating it onto g prime. But we could also do a g double prime graph. But this time what we have to look at are the slopes of this. So at this point, this point, this point, somewhere down here, I know that the slope has to equal 0. So the slope of my graph at negative 2, at negative 1, at 0, and at 3, those are all equal to 0. And again, if I look at the slope of this graph, notice over here, my slope is positive, then negative, positive, then negative, then positive. So now I can talk about concavity. So concave up, concave down, concave up, concave down, concave up. And that means that at this, all these points, these are all points of inflection.
Now, there's no way I can find the y values because, again, this is a graph of g prime, not a graph of g. Okay, now, we spent a lot of days on optimization, so I do have two examples planned for this. Take a look at your worksheets to see um, some more types of problems involving optimization, or definitely feel free to come see me as it was as, um, also. So in this first one, I kind of wanted to focus on the geometry. I have a rectangle inscribed inside a semicircle of radius 3. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a graph of a semicircle of radius 3. And I have a rectangle inscribed inside. And the question is, what is the largest perimeter that the rectangle can have? So what you want to focus on with optimization questions is first, what are you trying to optimize? In this case, we're trying to optimize the perimeter. So I'm going to call this x, x, and y. And so the perimeter is going to be 4x plus 2y. That was our main focus. Then what we looked at is what features we could use to reduce this equation down to one variable so that we could take the derivative, um, set it equal to 0, solve, all that kind of good stuff. So since this is a circle of radius 3, I know that x squared plus y squared has to equal 9. And consequently, I could solve for, let's say, y. So y equals the square root of 9 minus x squared. And now I can put that into the equation. So my perimeter is 4x plus 2 times the square root of 9 minus x squared. Um, and now what we're going to do is take the derivative of this. So p prime equals 4 plus square root, sorry, 4 plus uh, 9 minus x squared to the negative 1 half times negative 2x. I want to find when p prime equals 0. So I'm going to get a common denominator here. 4 square root of 9 minus x squared minus 2x all over square root of 9 minus x squared. And set that equal to 0 and solve. So I know my critical points would be x equals plus or minus 3, but that I don't need to worry about because that's on my endpoint. So I'm going to focus on the numerator instead. So 4 times the square root of 9 minus x squared minus 2x equals 0. 2x equals 4 square root of 9 minus x squared. Square both sides. 4x squared equals 16 times the quantity 9 minus x squared. Uh, let's see here. So if we get x squared equals 36 minus 4x squared, I'm going to pause because something happened here. 2x equals. I have a point. Oh! No, that's right. Okay, so then 5x squared equals 36. 6x equals plus or minus 6 over square root of 5. Now, I'm going to ask you to justify it as well, so we're going to practice our justification. So in this case, I'm going to do the first derivative test. I'm going to put negative 6 over square root of 5, 6 over square root of 5. If I substitute in something like 0 into the denominator, I'm going to get a positive value. If I put something in like uh, something larger than 6 over square root of 5 into it, I'm going to get a negative value and a negative value over here. So at this point here, it's going to be my relative max. And remember, you had to write a sentence for it. So you would say, there is a relative max at x equals 6 over root 5 because when x is less than 6 over root 5, p prime is greater than 0. And when x is greater than 6 over root 5, p prime is less than 0. So you have to justify it in terms of derivative. You can't just say where it goes from increasing to decreasing as a result. Now, not quite done because remember I wanted the perimeter. So my final step is to substitute in x into the perimeter. The perimeter was 4x plus 2 square root of 9 minus x squared. So if I substitute in this value, I'm going to get 24 over root 5 plus 2 times the square root of 9 minus 36 over 5. Now, this particular problem did not have units, 
so I didn't put any units in the answer. Don't make up your own units. So that was using the first derivative test. Now I want to do an optimization problem that involves cost, and we'll use the second derivative test in this case. So I have a company that wishes to produce a cylinder with a capacity of 1,250 cubic centimeters. So here's my cylinder. Uh, the top and the bottom must be made of material that costs 5 cents, and the material for the site is 3 cents. Um, so basically what we want to try to do is optimize the cost for this. We want to try to make it a minimum for the company. So our main focus in this case is not the volume, it's the cost that we're trying to minimize. The cost for this is 5 cents for the top and bottom, so 0 0.05 times 2 pi r squared, 3 cents for the sides, 2 pi r h. So that's our focus. Now, we know the volume of this has to be 1,250. So volume equals pi r squared h, which equals 1, 2, 5, 0. So what I could do in this equation is solve for h and then substitute it into my blue equation. So h equals 1, 2, 5, 0 over pi r squared. And I'm going to substitute it into this equation here. So now cost is going to be 0.1 pi r squared plus 0.06 pi r and then substituting my h. 1, 2, 5, 0 over pi r squared. So the pi's and one of the r's will cancel out as a result. So c equals 0.1 pi r squared plus, I think this reduces to 75 r to the negative 1. And just like the last problem, I'm going to take the derivative, set it equal to 0, and find the critical point. So c prime is going to equal 0.2 pi r minus 75 r to the negative 2. c prime equals 0 means that 0.2 pi r equals 75 over r squared. r cubed is going to equal uh, 5 times 75, which is 375 over pi. So r equals the cube root of 375 over pi centimeters. Now, same thing I want to justify, but this time I want to um, review the second derivative test, which is basically using concavity to determine if it's a relative min or a relative max. So if I take c double prime, I'm going to end up with 0.2 pi plus 150 r to the negative 3. So notice if I substitute in the cube root of 375 over pi into c prime, I am going to end up with a positive number, which means it's concave up, and therefore it has to be a relative min because it's a critical point for the first derivative and it's concave up. And again, you need a sentence to wrap this up. So your sentence would be something like, there is a relative min at r equals cube root of 375 over pi centimeters because at that point, C prime equals zero, meaning it's horizontally tangent. And C double prime is greater than zero, meaning it's concave up. And that is my second optimization problem. Okay, so a couple more things to wrap it up. We have uh, Newton's method, which was a way to find when a function is equal to zero. So up at the top, I have my formula for Newton's method, and I'm going to just show you how to set these two up. So in the first one, since I want when the function is equal to 0, I want to just use the fo uh, formula straight up. So x sub m plus 1 equals x minus the function, x cubed plus 2x minus 4, all over its derivative, 3x squared plus 2. And this is the kind where you substituted it into your calculator, you use the table set feature, into making it into ask to then solve for what it was. 
um, I got 1.1795 from the calculator. But we also could use Newton to find different values as well as we define a new function that satisfied the requirement. So if I want to find when the function is equal to 5, instead of using Newton's with f of x, this is what I'm interested in. So what I'm going to define is I'm going to let g of x equal f of x minus 5. Because then when g equals 0, or it's going to be when f of x equals 5. So f of x minus 5 is the function x cubed plus 2x minus 9. So now I'm going to use Newton's with this one. x sub n plus 1 equals x sub n minus the function all over the derivative. And for that one, I got 1.7625. So that was Newton's method. And the very last thing that we did was differentials. So we talked about relative error, um, or what was called percent error, and we talked about actual error for the differentials. So if I have the volume of a cone is 23 cubic inches, the height is 4 inches, if the volume has an error of 1.5 cubic inches, find the error in the radius. So we're going to start with our formula for the volume of a cone. I have written the height as 4, so I'll go ahead and substitute that in. And now we're going to take the derivative of both sides. So dv dr is equal to 8 thirds pi r. And then if you recall, what I did was I multiplied the other side by dr. So you get dv equals 8 thirds pi r dr. Now, dv represents the error in the volume, so in this case the error is 1.5 cubic inches. Um, r, we're going to have to solve for. So if I back up a step, I know the volume is 23. So 23 equals 1 third pi r squared h. Solve for r, and we're going to get r equals 2.343. So I'm going to substitute that into this equation. dr, and now we can solve for dr. So dr equals 0 0.076. So that was an actual error kind of question. Um, on the bottom here, what I have is a percent error kind of question. So this time what I have is I have the volume is allowed a maximum error of 5%. And this one is a cylinder as well. So I'll go ahead and start, or I'm sorry, this one is a cone as well. So I'm going to start from the cone formula. Um, and I'm going to use the 4 from above. So volume equals 4 thirds pi r squared. Take the derivative just like I had before. So 8 thirds pi r. So dv equals 8 thirds pi r dr. But this time, like I said, I'm not given the actual error in the volume. I'm given the percent. So I know that dv over v has to equal 0.02. But what I'm going to do is take this dv that I saw for here and substitute it in. So 8 thirds pi r dr over my volume formula, 1 third pi r squared 4, has to equal... 0.02. So let's see, the pi's cancel out, one of the r's cancel out, the third cancel out as well. So I have 0.05. So then I have 2dr over r equals 0.02. And then if I solve for this, I get dr over r equals 0.01. So my radius is allowed to change by 1%. And I'm just double checking my number. Okay, so then my last differential problem was where we had to make up our own function to work it out and then work out the differential as well. So since I'm trying to approximate cosine of 28, I'm going to let f of x equal cosine of x. I want a value close to 28 that I can actually calculate the cosine of. 
it's got to be in radians, so we'll make x equals pi over 6. And dx was the difference between what I was calculating at and what I'm actually trying to figure out. So dx in this case is negative 2 degrees, so negative 2 pi over 180. So if I take the derivative of this, dy dx equals negative sine x. So dy equals negative sine x dx. And this is going to be my differential. So I'm going to substitute in my pi over 6 for x, my negative 2 pi over 180 for my dx. And you get negative 1 half, negative 2 pi over 180. So my differential is going to be pi over 180. And that isn't what cosine of 28 is equal to. That is my error in my estimation for cosine of 28. So cosine of 28 degrees is going to equal cosine of 30 degrees, which I can actually figure out, plus this differential. So cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2 plus pi over 180 is my approximation for cosine of 28. Um, hopefully, I didn't make any algebra mistakes as I was going through, but definitely let me know, and I can add some um, editing comments to it. Thank you.